As uh, I mentioned last week, I want to encourage you to uh, open up your Bibles and follow along as we read scriptures. Uh, I tried to get into the Bible app this morning, and it looks like something's there. If uh, There's a link on our Facebook page to the live event. If anybody's in there and it's up and going, then just let me know. But uh, um, we had a hard time getting into it this morning, so you might have to go old school. There's a Bible in front of you for that purpose. In about the year 405 A.D., a young man named Patrick was captured by raiders from Ireland who took him from his homeland in Roman-controlled Britain and forced him into slavery. For about six years, he remained a slave until finally he was able to obtain passage on a ship and he escaped, eventually returning to his homeland where he was greeted like one who was returned from the dead. Patrick was certainly not the same man that he was when he left Britain. But what had changed most in his life was the deepening of his faith. You see, Patrick was a third generation, at least, Christian. His father and grandfather were both leaders in the churches in which he uh, was a part of in Britain. But for Patrick, it wasn't much of a reality. However, when he came back, he began a life that was led by the Spirit. And fairly soon, he began to have dreams where he heard what he called the voice of the Irish, calling him to, quote, come and walk with us once more. And so Patrick re returned to the land where he once lived as a slave in order to share and to live out the good news of Jesus Christ. In spite of many difficulties, both from the established church and from those who practiced false religions, he baptized thousands. He ordained pastoral pastors, and he led many to live lives completely dedicated to God. Now, legend has it that Patrick taught people about God's nature as Trinity by using the three-leaf clover. He would hold up a three-leaf clover and ask his audience, is it one leaf or three? And their reply was, it is both. And Patrick would then say, and so it is with God. Is the three-leaf clover an accurate way of describing God's nature? In my year at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, you can imagine that I had a lot of indoctrination about what the Trinity was. And one of the things I learned is that all of our symbols and examples to explain the triune nature of God uh, fall away. The three-leaf clover... Sometimes people you will use an egg, the outer shell, the white, and the yolk. All of these examples fall very short of the nature of God. But there are a few things, according to Scripture, that we can learn about the absolutes of God's nature. There are two absolutes concerning God's nature as Trinity that we can know. The first is that God is one God. It has been this way throughout Scripture. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one Lord. Now that's the first absolute, God is one. The second absolute is that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the testimony of this goes throughout Scripture. One of the great theologians of the 20th century, Millard Erickson, uh, describes it this way, and I like how he says it. The three persons of the Trinity are not separate individuals in the way in which three members of the human race are separate individuals. Each member of the Trinity is in his essence identical with the others or with the divine substance itself. Very important. Although God describes his nature as one God and three persons, throughout the centuries people have been making one of two mistakes as they try to understand him. The first is that either they push God's unity or his oneness too far and do not make distinctions between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or secondly, they push God's three-personness too far and emphasize the distinctions between the three persons of the Godhead. Now, as the early Christians began to struggle with how to express this nature of God, they came together to discuss these important issues. And in the year 381... 
the Council of Constantinople met and came up with a statement to which biblical Christianity has held to ever since. And the phrase in short was that God is one essence in three persons. This is the phrase that is used to describe what is truly undescribable and incomprehensible for human beings. We try to understand the nature of God and at every turn we fail. But we must hold to both of these aspects of God's nature. I think uh, a lesson in physics is helpful in this for us to understand. Because when I studied physics many years ago, I was told that light has two natures. It's both a wave and particles. You can't understand it to be not particles, and you can't understand it to be not a wave. But if you try to do experiments to find out the nature of light, you can't use the same experiment to find out whether light is a particle or a wave. And so both of these natures of light are accurate and hard to understand for human beings how they're both accurate at the same time. The same thing is true of God's nature. Three persons, one God. While the three persons of the Trinity can be distinguished numerically as person, they are indistinguishable in their essence or their substance. They are distinguishable as persons, but one and inseparable in their being. These are foundational doctrines of our faith. And why am I going on about the three in one personness of God this morning? Well, the reason is that for many believers today, the Holy Spirit has become the junior partner in the Trinity of God. Many people don't understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. And so, as a result of that, uh, they hold the Holy Spirit at arm's length. They don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a full and complete, in essence, part of God. Now, let me give you one example. I've heard people say that they don't pray to the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is, in fact, is, in fact, one in essence, with the triune God, then how is it that a person will not pray to the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father and the Son. And yet, I hear these comments. I don't pray to the Holy Spirit. And so we must understand biblically who the Holy Spirit is. Last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit bringing us life. This week, we want to talk about the nature of the Holy Spirit as our helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And um, to that end, Pastor Liz will be my helper today as she helps me to read some scriptures so I don't have to use my voice as much. So Pastor Liz, come up and read for us from John 14, please. Jesus told us, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. So John chapter 14. I'm sorry I didn't give you a chance to uh, turn uh, to John chapter 14, but we're going to stay there. If you're in John chapter 14, a little bit later, starting in verse 25, uh, verses 25 and 26. Pastor Liz, can you read that for us, please? These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 14. Thank you, Pastor Liz. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. Now, it's helpful for us to understand what he meant by that word. The word in Greek is called paraclete. And in essence, it has a wide range of meanings that all feed back to this concept of helper. Um, But there are a few different ways in which this word has been used to help. In ancient uh, Greece, the ancient Greek writers used it to describe a lawyer who was advocating on behalf of a person in court. And so sometimes this word is translated in the New Testament as advocate. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 1 is a good example where Jesus is called our advocate in the courtroom of heaven before God the Father, who is the righteous judge of the universe. We need an advocate. We need a lawyer. And Jesus pleads our case on our behalf before the Father by presenting a few facts. The first fact that he presents is that he died and gave his life on the cross for all of humanity and especially for those who trust in Christ and have put their faith in him. And so Jesus advocates. He is our helper on behalf of the Father so that we don't need to be punished for our crimes before God. When the Lord was talking with his disciples, John 14, 16, he said, I will ask the Father and I will give you another helper. And so Jesus is our helper, but he knew that he was not going to be on this earth for very long and that we would need another helper. Now, what's interesting about this word in Greek, another, the Greek word another means one that is of equal, uh, of equality with the thing that it's being compared to. So when Jesus said another helper, he wasn't saying a, a helper that was subservient to him. In essence, he was highlighting the nature of the Trinity that the Holy Spirit is one in essence with himself and with the Father. He is not a lesser part of the triune God, but a co-equal person. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be with us forever and in fact would live in us. We took a look at that last week. Because of this, we were never separated from his help. And um, uh, Kevin uh, gave us a great children's message about this morning. We are never separated from the help of God because the Holy Spirit is with us. This brought to mind the scripture from Psalm 23 where David wrote, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Now Jesus said the helper uh, that the Spirit brings, the help that the Spirit brings to us, um, which is one of the things that we most need, is to remind us of the truth. Jesus said the helper will bring to your remembrance all the things that I've taught you, all the things that I've told you. The Spirit, the Spirit brings it back into our memory as well. But the first step that we need to do is to put it into our memory. Jesus told his disciples, the Holy Spirit brought it back to their memory. We read the Bible, we study the Bible, we hear about the Bible. The Holy Spirit brings it back to our memory. This is why we do this little thing. Memorize, meditate, learn it, live it. Now, I know that some of you have been having a hard time. You can use a smartphone now. Some of you have crossed the bridge. Now, age has not kept you from learning how to use technology. This is old school. You can do it, right? It's just an L, waving an L. M and L, memorize, meditate, learn, and live it. You can do it. Not just the hand action, but we can also memorize and meditate and learn and live the word of God. And that's in fact what we need to do. As we do that, the Holy Spirit in the situation where we are at will bring to mind the word of God as we need it. How many of you can testify that in a certain situation, the words that God has put in your heart through memorizing, through learning, have come back to you at the exact right time that you needed it. It was there. Who did that for you? Well, Jesus says the Holy Spirit. That's his role. And we need his help in that because there are times when we are burdened down and we need the Holy Spirit to bring to memory those things which we know are true. The Holy Spirit is your helper. Now, here's the next step that you can take and you can say in a certain situation, Holy Spirit, I need your help. Would you remind me of the things that are true? We can call out to him. And you know what? That's his role. He wants to do it because that is how he helps us. The second point we want uh, to make that makes it a little bit more specific about how the Holy Spirit helps us. Three different areas, actually, first of all. The Holy Spirit brings us comfort, encouragement, and exhortation. And I want to roll th through these fairly quickly this morning. The first one is the Holy Spirit brings us comfort. We all need comfort from time to time. This is when 
the things that we have been hoping for are completely cut off. There's no, there's no option for the things that we were hoping for to actually become a reality. When Christmas passes and we don't get what we wanted for Christmas. When we fail a test and the grade comes back as an F. When our team loses. When a relationship ends. When the bills are due and we don't have money to pay. When we realize in our hearts that things are never going to change. When death forces us to say goodbye to the one that we love. In these moments, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And let me focus our attention on why we can understand this. Jesus, in John 14, right after he talked about the Holy Spirit as our helper, he said these words. And these are words that I've read many, many times. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now let me make a connection for you. The Holy Spirit gives fruits, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit are love and joy and peace. Why can the Holy Spirit give the fruit of peace to God's people? It's because the Holy Spirit is peace. And so when you have the helper, the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit is peace and brings people peace in to your heart. And so that's why when Jesus says, peace I leave with you, he's just talking, not talking just about a concept, he's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. Can we make that connection this morning? I'm leaving peace with you. It's substance. It's not a concept. So what does comfort provide for us? Does that mean that our problems have gone away? No, it means that the presence of God will be with us in all that we experience. The poem Footprints is a great example of the comfort of God during the difficult times of our lives. Some Christians have found footprints to be um, rather sappy. I actually really like that. I've never found that to be very sappy because the, the, the concept for me is so true that there's two footprints along um, the sand, along a beach, and during the difficult times of a person's life, as they're looking back and they're saying, one, one set of footprints was only there during the times of difficulty. And the, the, the Lord says, I, my child, I've always loved you and I've always been with you. It was during those difficult times that I picked you up and I carried you. To me, that's a wonderful picture of God who brings us comfort. Does he ever leave us? No. Do we recognize that he's there all the time? No, we don't recognize that he's there all the time. Because when difficulties weigh us down, sometimes we can get so focused on the problems that we forget that the Holy Spirit is always with us as our comforter. The Holy Spirit, secondly, brings us encouragement. The Holy Spirit is our encourager. One of the greatest forms of discouragement comes as we wrestle with our own weaknesses. We question whether or not we have the ability, the energy, the resources, or the power to be the, the kind of person that we believe that we are. In our weakness, the Spirit brings us help. The Spirit brings us help by interceding on our behalf. We don't know what to pray for, or we can't even pray. The Spirit prays for us using words that are, as human beings, we're unable to use. Um, there's a wonderful passage from Romans chapter 8. As you're turning there, I'm going to invite Pastor Liz uh, to read that for us. The first two verses, Romans 8, 26 through 28. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Good words. We struggle with the fear that things are not going to work out, but the Spirit reminds us with this teaching that God will work things together, all things together, 
for our good. We know this because we've been called out of our own purposes and into the purposes of God. And you know, we should not say, it'll all work out. Rather, instead, we should say, God will work things out. Because God is the mover and the shaker in our lives. There is no danger of him being voted out of office. There's a big amen to that coming. I know, that'll hit you sometime. There is no danger that God will not accomplish the purposes which he has intended in our world and in our lives. There is no danger in God not accomplishing his purposes. And what is his purpose? Well, Paul goes on to tell us what our purpose is in Romans 8, 29 through 30. And I'm going to ask Pastor Liz to read that for us. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I love these scriptures. We have a destination. When God calls us out of the darkness of spiritual death and into the light of spiritual life, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, we have a new destination. And the destination is that our life is going to be conformed, changed, transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful image. That is something that God is working. That is something that God is doing. That's his purpose. And I love how he brings it to the end because he's predestined. He's got a destination for us. And he calls us and then he justifies us. He, he clears us of all of the, the sins of wrongdoing. I like that. But then he glorifies us that it's not just about God taking away and dealing with the past. It's about giving us a new and brand new future where God is glorified in all that we do and all that we say and everything that we are. What a wonderful picture of God. And only God can do that. But he uses different means to bring that about. Now, let me give you a story of the means that God used to help me to be more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't fun, just as a precursor. Sometimes, God uses difficulties to bring about his best in us. When I first began in youth ministry, in, in ministry, I was a youth minister in, um, uh, outside of Pennsylvania. And uh, it was an independent church, and I had made a connection with the pastor during seminary in Virginia Beach. We became good friends. And he was looking to add some people to the church, and so he invited us to move from Washington, D.C. to be a part of the ministry that they were building. And once we arrived, things were different than what we expected. First of all, um, he asked me not to use the title pastor, but instead youth minister. And the reason why he asked me to do that because he didn't want any confusion in the church with who the pastor was. And I, I, I was a little taken aback. You see, I, I had been through seminary. I had been involved in ministry for several years up at that, that time. I had expected to have a title of a pastor. And yet he asked me to be instead youth minister. And so I said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll do that. That's no problem. The next thing that happened is he said, you know, we're good friends, but because I'm pastor of the entire church, our friendship is going to have to kind of take a back um, seat here. We can't be friends in the same way we were. And I, that was a shock to me. I, I, you know, I, I had a great relationship with, with him. And I, I thought, how, how can this be? I, 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 I feel like I'm going to be on my own now. I don't know anybody here. But I said, okay, all right. It was a difficult thing, but I agreed to it. And then finally, one of the kids in our youth group um, made a terrible mistake and uh, stood up in front of the church to give a testimony and lied about the entire thing. And I had to confront this uh, student about um, what they had done and, and basically say, you know, this is wrong. Well, their family um, were non-believers and they were very angry at what I had done. The, the parents of this student held it against me. And uh, the pastor who had invited me to come and be a part of the ministry did not back me up in this family. It was a very difficult thing for me to handle knowing that I had done the right thing and yet 
I had not been supported by the one who I felt should most support me. And so it was a very difficult time uh, where we were there in three years that we were in uh, this area. For two and a half of those years, I prayed to God to move us out. And the Lord said, when it's time to go, I'll let you know. And why do I share this story? Because looking back on it, there were some things that God needed to work out in my life. Some of those issues were pride and arrogance. And the thought that I knew what I was doing. You know how he, know how he worked that out? He changed things so that I didn't know what I was doing. And as I've uh, walked along in following the Lord and trying to serve him to the best of my ability, I have found this to be a truth, that the longer that I walk with the Lord, the more I realize my weaknesses, the more I recognize that anything that good has happened is because his strength works through me and because of his grace. And yet at the beginning... I was starting out like I knew what everything that was going on. And so I look back on that tough time of three years, not with anger, not with bitterness, but with gratitude. Because what God was building in me was working all things together for good. In those tough times where you feel like the ship is going down, you may not realize this. But the Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf. That God is working things together. When it feels like everything is falling apart, it might be that God is actually bringing you through to a greater experience of his glory working through your life. And so at the time, you may be like I was and just asking God to get me out of this situation. Well, hold on. Recognize that the Holy Spirit, God himself, is interceding, he is putting you in a situation, and he's going to work all things together for good. He is our encourager, the Holy Spirit. Now, finally, the Holy Spirit brings us exhortation. Exhortation is not a word that we use very often, but let me explain it this way. Sometimes the biggest help that we need is to know that we're going in the wrong direction, and to get a kick in the pants to go in the right direction. Amen to that? Somebody say amen to that, right? And you know what's awesome about this? God has provided authority in our life to provide the kicking in the pants. They call them parents. Amen to that? God has given parents the authority to give a little nudge in the right direction sometimes. Now it has to be done in love. It has to be done uh, properly and all that. Yeah. But I look back. Again, on the nudges that I got in the backside from my parents, and I say, thank you, Jesus, because this is how God does in our lives. Sometimes he gives us exhortation, and it basically says this, get with the program. Now, there's a verse, some verses from John chapter 16, uh, verses 7 through 11, that kind of encapsulate this exhortation. I'm going to have Pastor Liz stand up and Read that for us. John chapter 16, 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Amen. So you see that the help that the Holy Spirit brings us is conviction. But notice this in verse 8. He says, he will convict the world concerning sin. Notice that it's not just those who believe in him, but the world. Now, as I began to reflect on that, I said, well, how does the Lord convict the world? And this is how God does it. He does it through his people living out the truth day in and day out in front of people that are far from God. Let me give you an example of this. I waited tables during college. And uh, 
I had to put down on my um, uh, uh, taxes an estimation of how much I made in tips. Now, if you've ever waited tables, you know that it's common practice among wait staff to grossly underestimate how much they bring in, right? You, know, you understand this because they don't want to pay the money on the taxes. And uh, um, I was in a place where I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that I needed to put down an accurate estimation of my tips. Now, when I did that, I found a rather interesting phenomenon. The other wait staff came to me very angry and asked me why I was putting down all of the tips. Now, there was an ethical concern that I had that was in the background. Why did they have access to see what I put down on my own taxes and the W-2 forms? Why in the world did they have access to that? But we won't go into that ethical um, dilemma at this point. But needless to say, they all came with excuses about why the government didn't deserve to take as much money as they did. Now, I was simply living out my convictions. And I said, this is the right thing to do. They left me alone after a while. They were upset. But they said, all right, well, he's just one of those. Why did they have conviction? Why were they upset? You know why? It's because they were convicted that what they were doing was wrong. Why were they convicted? It's because a person who was trying to do his best to follow Christ brought into their sphere of influence and their, their frame of reference that there is a different way to do it. God's way is right and righteous and true. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to the world, but he uses God's people to bring that about. Not with a pointing finger, but with us living out the lifestyle and the truth that he has given to us through his word. We talked last week about how the Spirit of God leads God's people into all the truth. This is not always a warm and fuzzy kind of experience. Sometimes the Spirit uses others to give us a kick in the rear end because we're going down the wrong path. Now, just because something doesn't feel good doesn't mean that it doesn't come from God. Sometimes God provides, ouch, opportunities for us, and we have to recognize that they are from Him. It is not like the spirit of this age that God is all about feeling good, and if it doesn't feel good, it must not be from God. This is not showing up in the scripture. I want to guarantee you that this is not what the Bible says, that just because it feels good, that it's from God. Sometimes it feels very bad. It feels horrible. Sometimes it feels like life is about to end. But the truth and living out the truth is the role of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to give us help to live out the truth. Sometimes we need comfort to live out the truth because we're just worn down and it's just difficult. Sometimes we need encouragement because we're discouraged. We're facing difficulties that seem insurmountable. Sometimes it's a hardness of heart that the Holy Spirit kicks us into gear and says, you got to change. All of these things are good. They are the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we need to recognize that God is working in us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to bring them about. We all need lots of help. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And so let us treat the Holy Spirit as the senior partner of the Trinity that he is and allow him to bring us comfort, encouragement, and exhortation. To that end, let's pray. Holy Spirit, it is with great joy that we thank you that you help us, that you lead us into all the truth. And in order to lead us into all the truth, we need comfort sometimes. We need encouragement Sometimes we need that kick in the pants. And so thank you, God, that you do that. Help us to be able to be those that respond to the ministry that you have for us, whether that's comfort, encouragement, or exhortation. We pray this in Jesus' name.